Richard Hollis is here. He is the CEO of Risk Crew, a London-based cybersecurity risk management consulting firm. He's worked in the industry for over 30 years, developing his experience across the private sector, government, and military roles. Richard is a celebrated public speaker, and his articles can be found in a wide range of industry magazines, including Wired, SC, Info, SEC, and Security Penetration Testing Magazine. Unique to his sector, he and his cybersecurity consultancy are looking to shake up the conversation as to whether complete and impervious cybersecurity is even possible and where liability should be in an increasingly interconnected world. Richard, thank you for taking the time to join us. Welcome to the program. Brian, thank you for having me. I'm looking forward to this. Uh, thank you. So let's start with the basics, because I have found in our conversations around this topic, there are many definitions to cybersecurity and what people mean when they say it. Uh, what is yours? My definition of cybersecurity is it's, it's kind of the next generation of what used to be known as information security. That's the protection of data in computerized systems. And cybersecurity in its actual meaning is the protection of the device itself. So if the, with the understanding that if you protect the device, the information on it that's being processed, stored, or transmitted is inherently protected. Now, I, I don't necessarily believe that's true. I think the industry st struggles with the, I, the, def, the difference between protecting a device and protecting the information on that device, which is a completely different focus. So I, as you said in your introduction, I'm an old dog. I've been around for 30 years, and I'm not sure that the use of the term cybersecurity has been has helped us focus on what's important. And for me, that's the protection of the data, the sensitive data that's on that, be it a, a mobile or a laptop or a business system. What do you feel are, and this, this can be a broad question. So uh, when I ask people what the biggest threats that they see on a regular basis, I get a lot of variety of answers in that. And again, <laughs> sometimes those are physical threats. Sometimes they are truly data threats. Sometimes they're international actors. Sometimes they're homegrown criminals. So take this wherever you want and whatever you feel like the biggest threats that perhaps the business leaders listening to this program need to be focused on. Wow. Um, yeah, I'm going to take that and run with it in a completely different direction, Brian, because I think the way we always run is to run to the bad guy. And, uh, and I think that takes our eyes off what the problem is in terms of protecting the information on our devices. And by that, I mean, uh, yeah, okay, so the only constant in cybersecurity, information security industry is change. Every day you and I wake up, things change, technology changes. And so the vulnerabilities associated with that technology changes and the threats change and the risks change and change, 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 change. And so every day, you know, we're, we're always playing catch up. And because security is not included in the design of the technology, uh, you know, it, it's, it's an add on. It's a bolt on, as we as we you know, quietly call it at our security conferences. We're bolted on to cloud. We're bolted on to Wi-Fi. We're bolted on to whatever's next, uh, the next technology. So the, the landscape, the, the change is what's is what I focus on. And and, and the landscape in terms of if you get that, if you get tomorrow, there'll be a new threat. Tomorrow, there will be a new vulnerability. And then and if you're for me, that's almost noise. And, and for me, that takes your, 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 your focus off of what's important. And that's that, hey, the threat landscape is ever changing. So what do I need to do to establish a, a level of security integrity associated with this device, the system that I'm trying to protect? Okay, given the changing landscape, given that I can never do enough to protect uh, because tomorrow there'll be yet another, you know, tomorrow is, is, or is today's threat AI and tomorrow's threat is going to be yet more AI. And so rather than fight that fight and stay on that hamster wheel, I always advocate just the basics, you know, for, is understand your risk appetite. And then align that to what's on the th threat landscape. And you're going to see if you understand what you're willing to risk whether that's you as an individual on your personal phone or you as a business leader in your in your business systems and understand, all right, I can lose X and still live to fight another day. I can lose. But if I lose Y, it would put me out of business. And if you understood your risk appetite, you would look at the landscape of threats out there very differently. And some threats would would come would, would just jump right out at you and demand your attention. So if you understand what you're trying to protect, you will understand clearly when you look at the ever-changing threat landscape, what challenges you. And look at, and the best example of that is ransomware. Who didn't see that coming? 
if you understood malware, ransomware was an obvious, you know, it was an obvious evolution of malware. So, you know, we saw all this malware out there and then suddenly, bang, everybody understood ransomware was nobody had an appetite for ransomware because that would put you out of business. And that's the kind of focus that I, that I would advocate to anybody looking at, you know, look at what can touch you personally and professionally. Look at what, what is a threat to you, given your, your risk appetite, be that of your business or be that of you as a person, your own privacy threshold. You know that and you know what you can and cannot withstand out on the landscape. I think it's a great way to look at it, the risk appetite. So as you think about different industries or different businesses, it would seem to me that governments should have the lowest risk appetite. And yet, at least here in the United States, we see local, municipal, and state governments constantly being the victims of ransomware attacks, malware attacks, denial of service attacks. So it seems like they have a low risk tolerance, and yet they are either not investing in or not paying attention to this area. Do you have any thoughts as to why governments around the world are such easy targets or such frequent targets of these sorts of attacks? Uh, because they usually issue tenders to the lowest bidder. <laughs> and I know that because I work for the government. <laughs> uh, in my career, I, I know that for a fact. You know, government tenders go to the to, to the, the cheapest supplier, nine out of 10 times. Now, this is just generalization. But, you know, for, for me, when I hear that question, I automatically pivot to, well, gov government tries to save money and it saves money every way it possibly can. And, you know, and I know that we look at vendors who would bid for contracts uh, uh, when I worked for the government and, and, and that's the way they were rated, price first, price first. And when price is first, security isn't even in the top 10. So you're going to get, you know, uh, insecure by the way you structure a tender. So while I, you know, there are certain parts of the government, the intelligence community, uh, you know, uh, energy facilities, you know, that, that, that understand uh, their risk appetite, as it were, and, and pivot to that and put prior, you know, security in, in, the, in the correct priority. But in general, you know, a motor vehicle department, you know, a, a local tax authority or something like this understands, doesn't understand um, the price of security and doesn't put a premium on it in their tender. And so it goes out to the cheapest bidder. And of course, uh, you know, then it's too late. Then, then the solution is design uh, absent any sort of security integrity and then data is lost. And then it's a bolt on, a bolt on, a bolt on. So it's a natural, you know, you're going to get what you pay for um, situation to me. So what are the biggest vulnerabilities for the common business, regardless of your size, regardless of your industry, the things that everybody should be looking out for that are truly the fundamentals of, of a basic security setup? Okay, and I'll start with the first answer I gave you, which is businesses don't understand their risk appetite. They haven't quantified it. They haven't documented it. They haven't made it part of their culture. If they started with that first step, what is how much am I willing to risk? by connecting to the internet, by selling this product, by setting up this e-commerce platform. If I were hacked tomorrow, how much could I, you know, how much could I take and absorb and keep moving? What's my business risk appetite? That's the first thing that pe that businesses in general don't do. And they, if they did that, if they understood their threshold for risk uh, they, and, and, and approached cybersecurity as a risk management issue. See, I'm a guy who thinks cybersecurity, oxymoron, no such thing, right? There is no such thing as a secure, secure computer. Never was, never will be. There's always a back door. There's always a, a vulnerability. There's always a way. Um, so if you get that and you, you understand cybersecurity is a oxymoron, then you know cybersecurity is a risk management process to identify, minimize, and manage the risks. To what? To your risk appetite. So once you know your risk appetite, then, and you practice cybersecurity, that's practicing risk management. So you see every risk and the ones that, that are outside of your appetite and you deal with, you focus on those, bringing them within your appetite, making them acceptable. So if you did get ransomware and you got it, you could live to fight another day. That's, that to me is a cybersecurity strategy that you understand your appetite and that you understand that it's a process and by that, and, and I think that's a, that's those two pieces of, of, of advice are, are seldom taken by businesses. Businesses want to buy a product that enables security. They want to check a box to say, oh, we got a firewall. Let's move on. Let's, you know, uh, what, what's, the, what's the next item on the agenda? And they don't understand it's a process and it's not a product. 
cybersecurity. Oxymoron cybersecurity is not a product. It's a process. It's a process that requires products as part of the solution. But that's the biggest, if you ask me what the biggest vulnerability is, it's the perception that you can buy a cybersecurity product and to, to get you secure, quote unquote. That, that is a, a big fallacy in our industry. And you talk to guys like me and I, you know, who, who, who deal with customers and they're very frustrated because they buy a product. They buy a product to identify intrusions and then they've had a breach. And they ask me, Rich, how come the product didn't identify the breach? And I say, good point. You should bring that up with the vendor. Uh, and yet, you know, they go back to their to their to their service level agreement. And, you know, there is no guarantee that that intrusion detection service will actually identify an intrusion. And there's there's a disconnect. But you bought the product. So you assumed in buying that product to identify intrusions, you would get that functionality. And, and when we talk about vulnerabilities today, I think the biggest vulnerability is our misconception that we by buying security products, it makes us secure. I, I, I think, I, I, and I don't think we talk about that, it's certainly not in my industry. Uh, uh, we don't talk about that at events at, in my industry because those events are sponsored by products. So to stand up on a stage and say, hey, our products today aren't getting the job done. Uh, they're, they're, they're not fit for purpose. They're not up to the threats on the current landscape, much less they actually work. Our mal ransomware, great example. Ransomware is what? It's malware. Don't you have 20 different types of malware, uh, you know, uh, solutions running on your laptop on, in your business? I know I've, I've worked for a security company. We have five different malware uh, solutions running at a time. And my customer has 10 and he gets ransomware. And I say, ransomware is malware. Pick up the phone and call your, your malware provider and ask him, how come you didn't pick up this, this ransomware uh, uh, signature? And we, we make the disconnect. But he bought the malware. He bought the, the anti-malware solution. So he's expecting he won't have malware. And then he gets ransomware and doesn't connect the dots and think, hey, my anti-malware solution providers aren't getting the job done. How come malware providers, malware solution providers aren't part of the ransomware problem discussion? How come there's a disconnect? That's my problem. Then I think that's the vulnerability. The biggest vulnerability in businesses today is, is they, they, they work on assumptions that cybersecurity products are fit for this, the current cybersecurity landscape. They're fit for purpose and they work. And I think that's completely wrong. And so they get breached and they come to me and ask me why. I bought all this stuff, Rich, and it didn't work. I, I, I know I'm, see, now you, you've touched a nerve with me, Brian, because I, <laughs> I think I, I, it's not about what is, you know, is it ransomware? Is it this? Is it that? I believe that that landscape will be ever changing. I believe the biggest vulnerability is our approach. We lack a strategy and we, we put our faith in products that aren't fit for purpose. That's what I would believe. If you ask me to, you know, what is the problem in a nutshell? That's what I believe. It, it's, uh, I'm 30, we're 30 years down the road. In 1986, the first piece of malware was identified. 30 years down the road, and yet every year, the breaches are bigger than the year before. And it's funny because every year, businesses are spending more to prevent breaches. So there's no corollary. You think the more we spend, the less breaches we get. No. Year after year, the more we spend, the more, the more we lose. The more we spend, the more we lose. The more we spend, the more we lose. I've watched it successfully for over 30 years. Why is that? And I'm telling you, that's because of the assumptions that the things that we're doing work do are wrong. They don't work. Our products don't work. Our managed service providers don't work. Our, you know, our, our the internet, you know, the, our internet service providers. Nobody's providing us actual things that 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 address the issue. So one common risk mitigation tool for businesses and for individuals, for that matter, is insurance. Is there an insurance in the information security space? Could a business buy an insurance policy for something like this? Sure, sure you could. Um, it doesn't mean you won't get hit by a car. You buy insurance, you still it means it'll lessen the impact on your business. But I think we've all seen because of the ransomware epidemic, we've all seen insurers, you know, just like turtles, pull back into their shell because they've been hit so hard by this. Because they were putting out policies to giving them to companies who didn't have firewalls, who didn't have security policies, who weren't running anti malware, much less something that's effective against ransomware. They get hit yeah. by ransomware and they're paying out. So you know, and it's I find it odd because. You know, insurance, what is it, the second, old, second oldest, you know, uh, uh, 
profession on the earth, they say. Uh, uh, and if anybody could identify, you know, can come up to quantifying risk, this is an industry that should have done this. They should have been the first on the scene 30 years ago. These should be, the industry providers should be, because this is all about risk management, whether that's, you know, the, the risk of driving a car and, uh, uh, and, and getting in an, an accident or fire life safety, it's all the same idea. These, the industry, the insurance industry should be the leaders in cybersecurity, but they're not because they don't understand how to quantify risk, in cyber risk. Because yeah, and what I'm getting at, <clears throat> what I'm getting at in this too is is the idea that as we know in some areas of insurance, the danger gets so high all the insurers effectively pull back. Here in the United States, there are parts of the country now that it's effectively impossible to build a house because it's impossible to get an insurance yep. policy for it. Mm -hmm. And one of the concerns that I have, even for, let's call it e-commerce businesses, where the vast majority of what they do is all online, it's all an information service company, one breach ends the company. Um, it feels like these are going to become increasingly uninsurable, which means the risk will be so great that even if they do put in some processes, as we're talking about today, the fact that they won't have the backstop potentially of an insurance provider may actually stop businesses from existing, from starting. I'm curious if you see that as a serious threat to our economy going forward. I, I do. I I I think the risk will be transferred and we won't be able to to offload risk to an insurer to lessen the impact, just like like climate change has has, has prohibited insurance from, you know, uh, you can no longer build in you know, high risk fire regions or 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 low uh, sea level regions because of climate change. And they're not making any money because all they're doing is paying claims, paying claims. And that's exactly you're absolutely right, Brian. That's exactly what's happening in the cyber insurance. And ransomware was the first, you know, force fire that we saw on the cybersecurity landscape where insurance went, holy, this is uninsurable. It is uninsurable because we have no control over the variables and we have no control over or we have no formula to actually calculate the risk associated with that. You, you build a wooden house next to a forest, you know, and, and that's a high risk area. You build it on a beach, yeah, that's a high risk area. But businesses have to do business. And, 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 and as soon as you connect to the Internet, you're connecting to a high risk area. So you're absolutely right. I felt I, I think the insurance industry is not going to play the game is there's no money to be made in cybersecurity uh, uh, as an insurer now, just like there's. They're losing their money in, in you know, in, in insuring beach homes uh, uh, in low flood areas. It's exact. It's a perfect analogy. You're absolutely right. Uh, and we're losing it. Five years from now, you won't be able to get a cyber insurance policy. Every insurer I talk to now is reassessing, quote unquote, you know, their cyber portfolio because they're taking such a hit. It's not it's not a business for them anymore. So new technology can both benefit as well as exacerbate uh, this issue. And so the hot topic of the year has certainly been generative AI, chat GPT, the applications, the implications, machine learning. None of this is necessarily new. It's just becoming more accessible to the common person, which also means the common cyber criminal. Um, so I'm curious how you look at both sides of this. What do you think this technology has the potential to do for companies looking to shore up their information security systems? Uh, does it give them some new advantages in doing that? And then conversely, we know it will give the, the bad actors some new capabilities. Um, do you feel like those are going to be faster and easier to implement for the bad guys than the good guys? Uh, or how should we, as the common people of the world who are just trying to support our businesses, how should we be thinking about how these technologies can change the game in information security? Boy, I'm going to give you a really cynical answer here. For the last 30 years, I've what's seen what I've seen is repetition. You know, it's it's a we bring a, you know, we bring a knife, they bring a gun, we bring a gun, they bring a machine gun, we bring a machine gun, they bring a cannon, uh, you know, it, no matter what the defense there's because of the evolution of technology, there will always be, you know, quantum, uh, you know, quantum computing will be will bring quantum hacking. AI is, you know, 10, five years ago, kids were sitting in their basement working with machine learning to hack into systems. And that's, that's here now. And we fail to anticipate that with every arrival of every new technology will be a new security vulnerability associated with that because we fail to, to build technology 
we have failed. This industry, our, my industry, has failed uh, by implementing in implementing security by design. It is and, and understanding what's at stake uh, and and that everything can be used now as a threat. So with every new technology, because we've it's absent a design feature that addresses the security ramifications of that technology, we find ourselves at odds and we find ourselves at a loss. We keep repeating the same mistake. We keep, since it's just odd. So I, I am very cynical in terms of when we're going to learn that lesson. And AI came up, AI is the best example. It came on us too fast, too soon. And by the time we learn how to use AI as a defensive measure, the, the threat actors have already harnessed its capability as an offensive weapon. And we're, we will never get back on the front fo- uh, our front footing. That's how I feel. We, we come too late to the game. Um, and and like, like I said, we show up to a knife fight, a gunfight with a knife. This is the nature of what we do. And this is exactly where we are with AI. We're trying to figure out, you know, it's defensive uses. And I've got clients who are telling me they're getting uh, their attacks, the attacks that they're, uh, they see the source of the text and their machine learning. They're, they're essentially AI driven attacks now, and they don't have any defense. It was like the, it was ever. But five years ago, when we talked to, when we started to talk about AI, nobody started to to talk about the security ramifications and vulnerabilities associated with that. So what am I saying? I'm saying that this is a this is deja vu all over again. It is. I, we had the same discussion with Wi-Fi, with Bluetooth, with with cloud. Uh, you know, and now it's we have a new technology, uh, you know, a new evolution of technology that brings along a whole brand new level of sophistication in terms of the, the potential threat to the business. And we address that after the fact, after the fact. It's that bolt-on uh, syndrome I, I mentioned earlier. This is what we do in cybersecurity. So, yes, I'm, I, I, it's very bleak, uh, quite frankly. It's, it's very bleak, uh, uh, our lack of a vision, our lack of foresight. We didn't see this coming. Like my, my, my comment earlier, we didn't see ransomware coming. We, we didn't see that coming. Yeah, how could you not see that? And, and, and then the evolution of ransomware where you were, you know, they were encrypting the backups. Uh, you know, we'd go, if you had ransomware, you go to a backup and then, you know, ransomware uh, actors started to encrypt the backups before they encrypted the actual target. So when you went for your backup, it was already encrypted. We didn't see that coming. We, we don't, you know, we're, we're always, we're always reactive and we're never proactive. And that was my comment on, on the products that we're using today. They're reactive products. They're not proactive products. They're reacting to a threat that we had last year or the year before, or the year before that, but it just came out of, uh, out of R and D and it's on the, it, it's on the market and they've invested all this marketing. So it's going to be what we're going to buy for the next two or three years. And by then the, the threat actors have moved on because that's where the money is. And as soon as they understand, we put up a, a wall here, they look for a window over here. And we don't anticipate, hey, just closing this door, we, we might need to close all the windows in the design uh, to not make this technology so wide open. And we're shocked. We're shocked to find, you know, the, uh, the application was, sorry. Yeah. When you think about the threat actors, um, do we have, in your, in your opinion, because I know this is a very hard to pin down uh, answer, but is it the same big actors just innovating all the time or do you see new entrants into the threat space are there new whether they're state actors private actors just criminal thug types is it the same group that just keeps reinventing itself with new technology or is this actually a growing space i believe it's a growing a rapidly growing space five years ago ten years ago i think during when stuxnet came to everybody's attention and the understanding that zero day vulnerabilities uh you know given to to nation states had a huge impact on the cybersecurity landscape on the threat landscape today um and then what you've quickly found out is is nation states were buying zero day vulnerabilities from organized crime gangs and when the and that's a, that was a that was a line that got blurred for many of us when the you know it used to be white hats and black hats, but when the you know when nation states, when be that the United States or France or Israel or India or China buy zero day vulnerabilities from Russian atta- uh, Russian organized crime, all right that's a that's a mesh of the line you know that's a that's no longer white hats or black hats it's gold hats it's people with money. Who own the vulnerabilities and own the, you know, the 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 real threats come from them? So when nation states entered the threat actor uh, portfolio, you know the usual suspects. Nation states came on the scene. That was a complete. That was a game changer 
for guys like me, because no, there's no business on the planet that can protect from a nation state attack. And that, that, you know, it's like that, um, remember that scene in Crocodile Dundee where those, you know, he's walking with his girlfriend in Central Park and these thugs come out and they pull a knife and he smiles and she says, Hey, they have a knife. He said, that's not a knife. This is a knife. That's how I felt with nation states. You know, it's a whole different level of how to protect your system from a breach. If a nation states put you, put you in its sight, that's it. NSA wants to get into your system. There's no way that you have enough money to stop that from happening or much less resources. So, the nation states for me changed everything. When nation states bought zero day vulnerabilities from bad guy, that started, that was a slippery slope. So right now I don't see the world in good guys and bad guys. I just see it as it's an us and them and them is everybody. And it's expanding every day. There is so much money to be made in, in cyber crime. There is uh, so much money and it's, you know, it's little risk, high reward, little risk, yeah. high reward. There's an excellent FBI statistic. You know, the average bank robbery in the United States now, just last year, if you take a gun and run into a bank and rob a bank, you know how much you'll come out with? On average, on average, $1,800, $1, under $2,000. You get caught, you'll do, for armed robbery, you'll do 20 years to life mandatory minimum, all right? You take a computer, you rob that same bank, you know what the average return is? First time, hack, $5 million U.S., you get caught. You know what you, you know. What kind of time you'll do? Six to nine months. First offense. If you're a seventeen-year-old kid, I mean, what idiot picks up a bank, uh, picks up a gun to rob a bank these days? The, the return and the risk and and the statistical, you know, statistically, it's so hard to get caught for cybercrime that everybody and their brother. It's not like you know. It's not the risk it, you know of robbing. Uh, it's not a risk associated with robbing a bank and getting far, 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 far less. So, I'm amazed. I'm amazed easy. by that slap on the wrist mentality. Well, it's it's because we, we, we don't have, you know, our, our, our culture has not produced legislation to punish because we still don't understand computer crime. We're still struggling to understand computer crime. You steal ones and zeros. That's not stealing. Like, you know, yeah, that's a very different thing than stealing somebody's wallet. If I tackled you down in the street and grabbed your wallet and ran away, you'd physically chase me. There's there's a sense we understand what's being taken from us, but what if I get into your in, into your computer and take ones and zeros from you that may end up to be your identity that I use for identity theft or your bank account or whatever it is? That's a completely different. We just can't get our heads around that. So there's a disconnect. Um, for for me, there's a disconnect. Anyway, cybercrime is is low risk, high reward, and if you're even a yeah, what? That's a huge draw. I don't care if you're a student struggling to pay off a student debt, uh, you know, and you, you you turn over a zero day vulnerability to on the dark web. You can sell them. There's so much money. It's it's um, reminds me of you know the '80s and cocaine. Uh, it, it is just just so much money that it turns people who usually are criminals into well, you know, and who are fascinated with computers. Um, yeah. So you mentioned uh, organized crime, uh, and it does feel like this would be a very, very lucrative environment for those who are currently gun running and drug smuggling and doing all kinds of other black market activities. So when you look at the organized crime profile, are you seeing actors in that space that have traditionally played in other black markets that are now trying to figure out how to get into this one? Or are these organized criminals actually very focused on the technological aspect of their enterprise? Uh, it's the second. It's actually, you know, five years ago, I would say that organized crime, you know, uh, be it, you know, traditional organized crime like Yakuza or, you know, somebody you and I see it yeah, as recognized organized crime in movies. Everybody was playing with what, what is there? How much money is there to be made? You know, should we should we stop, uh, you know, uh, smuggling heroin and, and get into cyber? everybody's into cybercrime, every organized crime on the face of the uh, planet. Uh, and, and there are organized crime gangs that come together for short periods who literally come together and say, for the next six months, uh, I've got a database and uh, and they pool their talent. And there are there are stable organized crimes like bricks and mortars, organized crime. But every I. I you know, like I said, five years ago, they were considering it. Now it is a line of business, of, uh, and it is the line of business. It is the line of business. Cybercrime today far outstrips uh, the sale, sale of illegal drugs globally, worldwide. The, 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 and, and that just happened like two years ago. 
and and I, and I don't know what you know the the cocaine market is globally, but I but somebody mentioned to me, and I heard at a, at a three or four ev- uh, events in a row when when a statistic came out by the FBI is like it's and it's literally like five times the money that's being turned over in cybercrime today in terms of old old you know street crime, what you and I used to, re- what I certainly recognize as, you know, a uh, uh, high payoff street crime like, like cocaine drugs in the 80s. Now, you mentioned earlier, we blew past it. Uh, you, you said zero day vulnerabilities, I think was the term. This was the, when we we're talking about nation states. Let's just pause for a moment for, for myself and for the audience that doesn't know what that means. Help, help us understand that particular tool. Thank you. Thanks for that, because I, I pass by a lot of things where I should slow down and explain my terms. A zero day vulnerability. OK, for uh, who, who was it that, you know, there are no knowns and there are there are things that we know and that there are things what we know that we don't know. And there are things that we don't know that we don't know. The unknown unknowns. And that's how I would describe a zero day vulnerability. It is a vulnerability associated with a product or an application or a new Microsoft release of this or a new uh, Citrix release of that. Okay, that there's a vulnerability in it, but there's not a vulnerability that the vendor Citrix or Microsoft has acknowledged that exists. Okay, to the world and is working on a patch. So they, you know, so they've released it and you and I are using it. All right, but but threat actors understand it because they've seen they've found a vulnerability and they sell that vulnerability. They say here, it, there's no patch for this. It's an unknown unknown. So uh, the vendor has not acknowledged it and has not made it has not announced a fix for it. So it's a backdoor potentially. You know, it's a it's a it's a it's access to this application that shouldn't be given. All right, and it's known in the threat uh, in the in the amongst the threat actors. And they use that. So it's an unknown unknown. And you and I are rushing around trying to protect known vulnerabilities, the known knowns. And we're updating, we're putting in patches and fixing and, and, and you know, changing our passwords and doing all this where there's an invisible backdoor associated with this application. It's a zero day vulnerability. All right. The, now, the day it becomes known by the vendor and announced, the vendor sees it and starts working on a patch. The zero day stops and it's the clock starts ticking. Six to nine months, the, the vendor might say, here's the patch for that vulnerability. All right. And then you and I are, are working on the next six to nine months to try to, to fix that patch. All right. So zero day vulnerabilities are very powerful things. And then once they've been acknowledged by the vendor, they're still powerful until you and I get a patch for it. Now, we have the option to stop using that application or wherever the vulnerability, but we don't do that. So there's a, the zero day vulnerability. When I use that term, when anybody uses that term in cyber, they're referring to the an unknown vulnerability that that we don't know, and so we can't address. And so, if we have a risk appetite, it doesn't. You know, and we and there's an unknown vulnerability. We can't either accept it or patch it. And it is it is a it is a target on our backs. And 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 that's when I get back. And when I said earlier, I'm, I'm you know in our industry, we're not practicing security by design. We are releasing applications with vulnerabilities in it that are unbeknownst to the to the manufacturer of that application and shame on them shame on them for giving us something with a vulnerability that they didn't know about i can't get my head around that how can a how can a, a vendor manufacture anything and not know what's in it so, but they do but and it is and it's a reality so you and i use use applications and operating systems with vulnerabilities that we don't even know in there because the the manufacturer does know but threat actors know and so we're vulnerable because of it and you certainly highlighted how nation states getting in this space has really changed the game. There's virtually nothing you can do as a private citizen or business if you're targeted by one. But let's now shift to the applications of this in geopolitics, right? We are talking now about a space where any conflict is going to be fought both in a physical space and in a cyberspace. And we're seeing that around the world. Um, you have consulted with and advised uh, militaries, is my understanding. Um, there's probably a lot of things you can't talk about, but of what you can talk about, how do militaries, or let's just call them nation states that have a national security um, thought process for how they would use these tools and, and services, how do you see their thoughts differ from how private sector businesses and just your benign, um, you know, civilian applications of these tools. Okay. Um, for me, a nation state has two objectives in cybersecurity. 
is one to disrupt another nation state and two is let's just call it the theft of intellectual property fine you know uh, e economic gain uh by a nation state so usually when a nation state's on the threat landscape they're after two things they're after a command and control of of a of a critical infrastructure of of a be that an airport or a utilities you know electrical grid or or a train track uh, uh, yeah they're after to to be able to take command and control and shut down and, and impact another nation and uh, uh the operations okay to have an effect that could be used as an advantage and and that is the that is the nation state activity that you and I don't see okay you, you know where we have seen it look at the russia ukraine conflict you know where suddenly you know uh, ukraine loses a third of their grid and that's going back and forth and it's it's point counterpoint you know it's 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 that's that's the what's being played back and forth is is the attempt to get command and tr control between the two nation states in, in, using cyber attacks and that's a really good example and it, but 9 out of 10 times you and I don't see that suddenly in the paper we'll read this thing that you know the city of Fairbanks Alaska lost power inexplicably for 24 minutes okay that's somebody playing around and you see these all over if you pay attention. You see this going on. That's somebody, see if we can take, you know, command and control of the Fairbanks. Uh, we'll, we'll watch, I'll get a letter from somebody up in Fairbanks. <laughs> but, yeah, <laughs> but my point is, you, you know, you, you want to demonstrate that you have command and control. Once that, you just sit on it and you understand that that's in your arsenal. You can turn off the electricity of uh, city A, B, and C, or you can shut down the nuclear cap power capability of, of country X. All right, so these are what nation states seek to attempt. That's on the side. The other thing that that you do see, and 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 it's almost it comes in waves, is is um, intellectual property theft. Whether that's you know uh, look at nation states who are you know chasing up car manufacturers for the next electrical uh, you know hybrid uh, or or wind or solar energy uh, intellectual property. I mean the theft to to be able to short circuit their R and D time and go to market quicker with something faster you know and cheaper. That's for me in my experience in the last thirty years the two the two types of activity I see on the cyberscape landscape. Either way, but in terms of just surveillance or 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 uh, you know, I have clients who have intellectual property and they come to us and say, "How do I protect a nation state like China from getting into my systems?" And I say, "You can't. You can't. You're not China. You you, you don't have the resources, the time, the energy, the money uh, that this nation state does. So you cannot protect." Uh, you know, and we've every not we've uh, everybody's lost a lot of intellectual property to nation state actors who because of the weight, you know, that knife they bring to the table and so on. That's not a denial of service attack. This is a denial of service attack. And there's just no way you can you can protect your systems for that. I have let me give you an example that before I shut up on this is, is that about five years ago, I saw people with real intellectual property who did not who did not put it into computer systems, all right? And it's just like we're going back to paper and pencil because the devices that we put that in cannot be trusted. I don't care. Forget that it's in a bubble. It's not connected to the internet. Everything's connected to the internet. There's no such thing. Uh, and, and so, I mean, real sensitive, I, I've seen very sophisticated uh, um, clients who say this is this does not go into this this data this sensitive information does not go into computing systems for this amount of time to ensure that we have a go to market lead now that's that's a and that that to me was proof of my computer security oxymoron there's no such thing so if you have something you really want to protect don't put it in a computerized device if you were advising a business on uh, figuring out their risk appetite and let's say they had a big risk appetite for whatever reason perhaps they have an enormous amount of financial backing they feel like they can cover for certain losses maybe they even feel like they can move on if their business were to fail um so the, we'll call these the gamblers of the industry uh, i don't think there's too many of them but there must be some even for those we know that this is a space where the threats can be so great it can just wipe you out um what is the minimum standard that you think any business, no matter how much risk you're willing to take, needs to have in place just to be responsible to their own customers' data, let alone just being a responsible participant in the global economy and the economy of their country? Well, um, I run a business, Brian, and I'd like to think I have zero tolerance. I have a zero risk, uh, you know, a capacity for risk. There's 
there's a risk appetite. There's your tolerance for a little above it or below it. You know, there's a little wiggle room. Give me a little wiggle room. You know, I run a small business. Uh, 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 and and I, I, first of all, let me back up and say, it's got to be a, a dollar figure, a financial amount that should be a, a, a ratio of your turnover and that your board understands if we lose 50% of our turnover, we're, you know, in, in, for one incident, we're out of business. Uh, and, and, and because associated with that is legal fines and, and, you know, and court costs and, and other things that might come after. But if you had one breach, like in ransomware demonstrated everybody's appetite where suddenly businesses just disappeared, just like that, just over, you know, overnight, because they were small mom and pop dot com businesses who were selling flowers on the web, who were turning over half a million dollars a, uh, a year and suddenly ransomware st- uh, completely locked up their billing. And they couldn't pay because they didn't have the cash. They couldn't pay the twenty thousand, thirty thousand uh, dollar ransomware. Done. You're out of business. So that's what I talk about. With you have to know your pain point. You have to know your limitation. And for me, that's a ratio in business terms. That's that's a that's a that's a bottom line dollar. Now, once the board has recognized that and documented that and signed up to that, then they've got to you know now that you have you talk the talk, you got to walk the walk. And you you would the assumption is you're going to put in controls to make sure that the, whatever happens. That in, you did have a breach, you, the financial impact would not exceed your appetite. Okay. So having said that, I honestly, um, I don't, maybe, you know, of, of businesses, I think maybe one out of 10 businesses, and they're usually financial businesses who understand financial risk management and who have financial risk models in place for other things and find it easy to adopt a cybersecurity risk model to say, if we had a breach, we would lose X. But if you, if you're, if you're a florist, if you're a shoemaker, if you're a car manufacturer, you're not, you don't have that, you don't speak that language. And so you, you, you can't quantify, it'll take this many euros or this many pounds or this many dollars to put us out of business. But the minute you did that, you'd have such clarity in terms of what resources you needed to put in place to prevent that appetite from being disrupted. Um, it, it, it brings everything that, you know, money clarifies everybody's thinking as it were, as it were. And that's what's missing today. The very few business, I, I don't, not out of nine, more than 90% of the businesses, I, I, I walk into the board and I say, how much are you prepared to lose? And they said, well, we don't want to lose anything. And I say, cybersecurity is an oxymoron. So get over it. You're going to, you're going to lose something. You have to, it, there's risk. It's, a, you know, there, there's risk. One of the best brand um, things we use out here in the UK is, and it's not so relevant now, but it used to be, you know, 10, 15 years ago is the Virgin brand. You know, Richard Branson was, was he had the, he, he wanted his business to be seen as a high risk, high reward business. Right. Um, he, and, 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 and that we would point to that and say, there's a culture. He wants to implement a culture of high risk because you take risk, you get rewards. That's true. But with risk, you know, also comes impact adversely. Um, uh, but, but that was a, that's a, that's a cultural reference point in the UK as a business with, and our UK is filled with, you know, a lot of financials with very low risk tolerance. At least they say they are. But when you say, where's, how much is that breach? And they say, we don't know. And you'd say, well, then, you know, you're just, you're just gambling. You're taking that and put that on your risk register that you don't have a risk appetite because that's the biggest risk that you have uh, is that you don't know how, how big of a breach will put you out of business. And that lack of focus, I don't, I don't akin that to the U, just the United Kingdom. I think that's everybody's, we're like deer in headlights when it comes to cybersecurity. And we don't start with the very simple, you know, how much can I lose? It's like... You know, you, I've never been to Vegas, so I shouldn't use this. But you go into Vegas and you take all your money and you just put twenty, twenty, or hundred dollars. You say, once I lose this, I go. You have to have that when it comes to cybersecurity and understand. I can't lose more than this, or you know, I can't pay the mortgage this year or this month. I think you've been very articulate today in pointing out the blind spots in your own industry, which is admirable. Uh, so often people want to cover for that. And you've got a lot of years of experience behind you. So is what you're telling us today widely understood in your industry? Or are you having to go to conferences like this and really wake, shake people and wake them up and say, guys and gals, we know we got to get better at this? I, I Again, so... You know, just to just to put my 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 reply in context, I'm a cybersecurity slash information security professional for over 30 years. I don't sell product. 
Um, you know, I believe in process over product. Now, what I'm saying is that my peers, my colleagues, when I go to cybersecurity conferences, uh, you know, what's said on the stage is not what's said at the bar. What's said at the bar is we are failing miserably. We are failing miserably. What's set up the bar is exactly what I was talking about in terms of our products don't work, our services don't work. Um, it, it, we are not geared for uh, uh, for success in our industry. We look at cybersecurity as the protection of ones and zeros. And this is about protecting data about people's lives. And we don't make that connection. You know, we don't make that connection. When I was telling you, I walk into a board, that's one of the first questions I have. Any board members, their personal data, where their children go to school, their medical records, are is that in the system? Put that in the system and see how much you, you would spend to protect that. Put some skin in the game. And that's what's missing, that disconnect by cybersecurity professionals who go on stage and talk about firewalls and then come off stage and talk about, you know, it's funny, we said that we, cybersecurity, if you saw my tattoo, it's about protecting people, process, and technology, right? That's what every cybersecurity, people, process, and technology. And yet all we do is talk about technology and we neglect the people and we neglect the process. We neglect the end users and we neglect the business process to integrate cybersecurity to get that culture and get and, and realize and make that appetite a living, working thing in the business. And so we neglect two thirds of what we believe is, is the right cybersecurity strategy. So and, and I tell you, people like me, maybe it's my age. I'm getting old, Brian. I'm getting cranky. But but that's what we talk about is where did we miss this? Why did we let vendors lead the marketing messages? You know, this is about protecting personal data about people's lives. And, and we're using products that don't work. And now we, we talk about that amongst ourselves, but we don't educate. We don't try to fix it. Let me just say this in some, we don't exercise a, a, you know, when we buy something and it doesn't work, when you and I buy a flat screen TV and it doesn't work, we take it back. That's just, it's consumerism 101. Ralph Nader taught me that, you know. Ralph Nader, you know, fought tirelessly to put a seatbelt in, 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 you know, in, in, in get Detroit auto manufacturers to put seatbelt in cars. Where's that, where's that revolution in cybersecurity? We, don't, we have products that don't work. Why aren't we taking them back? Why aren't we applying the same excellence that we demand of everything we buy to our own industry? That's what cybersecurity experts talk about at the bar, but they never talk about it on the stage and, and, and try to affect real change. But if you and I and, and, and started by, and starting, you say, well, wait a minute, this, this, this mal, anti-malware solution doesn't work. I want my money back, please. I've got ransomware. Do you want to pay for this? And, and I've got a brother who sends back a, a glass of Coke because it doesn't have enough ice in it. And he's got a small business and, and his ISP is sent a denial of service and knocked his business out. And he calls me and I said, we'll call your ISP and ask him, well, you know, what are you going to do about, I've got a denial of service and I got malware over my connection, over, over, over your internet connection. Come, why don't we, there seems to be a lack of consumer anger in our industry. And that's what cybersecurity experts talk about at the bar. Besides, I know, am, and also, who's going to pick up the bill? <laughs> yes. I am uh, fascinated, Richard, by how you ended up in this industry. Uh, did, is this something that you aspired to in the beginning, or did, uh, did information security in this space come to you? I got to tell you, I'm embarrassed to answer this, and I'll answer you truthfully, Brian. When I was a kid, I was not a good kid. I was a bad kid. I was a bad kid, and meaning by that, um, I, you know, I had a I had a background of of coming from a home where I could stay out late at night, I, I and you know, and I was kind of raised on the streets with other bad kids, and but I knew very quickly, you know, I, I so I, I guess what I'm saying is, so as a kid, I realized that I had a knack, I had a talent for identifying vulnerabilities. I could walk by a bike and say that bike's not locked. I could steal that if I wanted to. Yeah, that car window's open, you know, that, 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 that person. Died. And I saw these little vulnerabilities, you know, because I lived, I grew up in a neighborhood where if you were a bad kid and you saw opportunities, you did. All right. So as I grew up, I realized, okay, I have a, I have a talent for seeing vulnerabilities that could be exploited. Now you could either get into the police, law enforcement, uh, or you could be a criminal. For me, that's a very binary, you know, if you have that skill set, you can see vulnerabilities and you know how to exploit them and get away with it. You could you could either be, you know, the law enforcement side or, you know, the white side or the black side. And I realized very quickly, well, I can't do time. 
<laughs> so and I and, and you know so I thought yeah I, I just couldn't do time. I'm one of these guys who are easily you know a criminal who uh, is easily deflected by a, a jail sentence. But and the flip side of it is I didn't want to be a cop. I didn't want to carry a gun. I didn't have a law enforcement gotcha mentality. And I, as I grew older and I, I got out of school, I found myself working in security where I had a talent for f- finding weak spots. You know, I could jump that fence. I could, I could disable that camera. I could, you know, I could, and it just extended into computer systems. And you, so it's a funny thing because as you, I don't know if you struggled this when you were a kid, but I grew up with kids who, um, you know, went on to be doctors and lawyers and musicians. And I was just, where did they get this talent? I knew a kid who looked at his hands and said, I'm going to play a piano and actually did that. And I was always jealous of these children, you know, and I thought, what can I do? I know how to spot vulnerabilities, but I'm too weak to be a criminal and I don't want to be a cop. And, and that's how I found myself in my profession. Sorry. No, that's great. That's the kind of background we want. And uh, uh, last question for you is uh, you're the obvious CEO of a very uh, important consulting firm, uh, Risk Crew. Uh, and we'll give you a moment at the end of the program to let people know how they can find out more about that. Um, I'm curious about your leadership style. Um, this is a, a unique consulting firm, uh, certainly different than perhaps your management consulting firms that people are familiar with around the world and so forth. Um, as you've been bringing in talent and, and building this company, uh, what have you learned over your years in this? Uh, how, how has your leadership style evolved and changed and matured? Well, it's I, I've certainly, um, I used to look for, let me answer this in two ways. One is you're hearing a lot of my style, you know, it's process, it's not product. I mean, I, I do I do set up guardrails. And so we, we are a security consultancy here. And the consultants that I attract are with this religion that I have in terms of it's process, it's not product. Uh, and that is, and, and in my industry, there are people who think product is the answer. There are other people who think product's not the answer. It's a problem and it's process. We're not doing enough process. So obviously, you know, in terms of a consultancy, I look for people who, who look at the, who believe cybersecurity oxymoron. Now, where that takes you as a professional is I let them take, you know, but if they believe in that simple premise, I think they're on the right track. And I think that they have a, a promising cybersecurity future. The other thing that everybody complains, there's not enough talent out there. And you know what? There isn't, there isn't. But you know what? Just like I told you, an inquisitive kid who can spot vulnerabilities is a very can be a very uh, high potential cybersecurity professional. And what I look for when I look for like penetration testers, I don't care if they have certifications. I don't care if they've never pen tested before. I care that, you know, I, they talk to me and say, I've been working with computers since I was eight. I started rebuilding and, and, but, and breaking into computers because I like the way I look for an inquisitive mind. And just like I said, what I thought my talents were, the, identi- the ability to identify vulnerabilities and exploit them. And, 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 and to me, that's the key that, that it's taken me, it's been the most, when I realize about my, my professional arc, you know, it's got that and every bad decision I ever made, it's got me where I am today, but I'm saying, you know, that to me is certainly what I think is a skill set that I have found useful at the end of the day. And so I look for that in both in technical talent and in risk talent that I buy, you know, the understanding that cybersecurity is an oxymoron. So we just got to deal with that. Uh, and it takes a really flexible mind to deal with that concept. As And when it comes to testing and finding vulnerabilities in systems, I'm just looking for somebody who doesn't give up, who's curious and who won't give up until they find that little thing that wasn't meant to do that. But if you did that, you could exploit it. And, you know, those those people don't have to have cybersecurity certifications at all. In fact, I feel it, it almost clouds their thinking. Uh, the most effective penetration testers I've ever hired were good, good people with inquisitive minds. And that's the fu- that for me, that's got to be the future of our industry. If people would like to learn more about Risk Crew or about you, uh, where can they go to find out more? Uh, I, I'm, we're at risk crew, uh, risk crew.com and, uh, you can take a look at, and a lot of what I've been talking about in terms of the tone, the tenor of the messaging is, is, is there, but I'm at risk crew.com. If you have any questions, I'm on, I'm on LinkedIn. It's Richard Hollis uh, on LinkedIn, but, uh, I'd be happy to, to, uh, uh, take any questions or, or comments or, or, or observations or counterpoints, counterpoints to, to anything I made tonight, uh, bring it on. Love to hear it. Thank you, Brian.
Absolutely. We will include the links to that in the description of this podcast. Richard, you've been very generous with your time. We appreciate it. And uh, perhaps we'll have you back in the future as this space continues to evolve and there'll be ever more news to cover. And I'll be loving to hear your perspective on it. Thank you, Brian. Appreciate you having me. Thanks very much. One of the most fun aspects of this show is the ability to talk to people like Richard, not just about all the things that they talk about at conferences, seminars, and sort of picking their brain about their industry, but to spend an hour with somebody and really learn, as we talked about earlier in the show, what, what gets talked about at the bar? What do we talk about behind the scenes when the public isn't around, when we're not worried about our stage presence, when we're just thinking as professionals about what's happening? And I think this was a very important interview for all of you who have a fascination in the space of cybersecurity. You know it's complicated. You know it's complex. You you almost know it's impossible to provide yourself 100% coverage. Well, hopefully this gave you a sense that, first of all, there are a lot of positive people working on this issue. But um, be skeptical of what you hear and really push and poke and prod at those service providers out there who insist that they've got the you know, drop dead solution that if you just implement this, there'll be no issues, no problems, no challenges. And I think it's important that we have industry experts like Richard, who are at a point in their career where they can speak openly, honestly, and from experience about the threat landscape, the challenges that face so many of us in the business community, but also face ordinary consumers and everyday citizens, including, let's face it, countries and, and governments are involved in this as well. So, like I ask all of my uh, listeners about every episode, I'm going to go back and listen to this program again. I hope you go back and listen to it again. Download it if you want onto your device. Certainly you have access to it anywhere you get your podcast. Just subscribe to Brian J. Matos, the Brian J. Matos Show, and you can go back anytime, listen to this show again. I encourage you to go back to all of our other interviews and take a listen to those a second, a third, a fourth time, every time that I listen to these programs for the second and third time, I pick up on some nuance that I was either distracted the first time around or just something that I didn't fully absorb. And I try to be as present as I can in these interviews to not miss the opportunities for follow-ups. But there are just some of those little points that fly over your head the first time you have a conversation like this and then the second third fourth time you hear it you let it sink in a little bit more uh, and that's the reason why i hope to have folks like richard and others on again uh, so that all of you have time to absorb these interviews ask your questions of me i'll gather them up i can bring some of these folks back for a follow-up and we can have an even deeper dive discussion having already teed it up for the first time so a couple of uh, quick notes. First of all, a weekly reminder that you can subscribe to this podcast anywhere, truly anywhere that you get your podcasts. We are on Apple Podcasts. We are on Spotify. We are on iHeartRadio. We are on the Odyssey app. We are on Audible. Uh, pretty much any app that you can think of that hosts podcasts reliably. In fact, uh, my my team and I were just uh, looking the other day to make sure we were on the Samsung podcast platform. I know it's not necessarily as big as Apple, Spotify, or some of the others, but still, uh, a few of our listeners had been uh, sending me some messages asking if I was on that platform, and uh, we verified that this week, so we absolutely are. And then let's talk about how you can connect with me. So the easiest way to connect, as so many of you have been doing, is through email. Uh, my general inbox is info, I-N-F-O, at brianjmatos.com. You can send comments, inquiries, questions, thoughts, suggestions for future shows, uh, and I do read all of your messages. So uh, even if it takes me a couple of days, bear with me, <laughs> be patient. I do get a lot of feedback, um, but I definitely want to engage with all of you. And email is still the most direct way that you can do that. But some of you are social media natives. You'd prefer to engage on those platforms. I am on all of them. Uh, I am more routinely on Facebook and Twitter than the other channels, but I check all of my accounts every day. So Brian dot matos on facebook you can also follow and i encourage you to follow my facebook page for this show with brian j matos podcast you can follow that program i post the links to each week's new show uh, every week you can follow me on twitter i do the same there at brian j matos happy to engage with you on that platform um 
not sure where it's going, but uh, Facebook's alternative to Twitter, Threads, is out there. Since I have an Instagram account, uh, at Brian J. Matos, I was very easily able to set up a Threads account, and I have my first couple of posts there. So if you prefer that as an alternative to Twitter, I'm already on that platform and engaging with you. So f- follow my uh, my Threads account, at Brian J. Matos. Uh, and a lot of folks are finding interest in our show clips on youtube uh which i appreciate we have shorter clips of these programs including clips from this episode uh and i have found that these are really helpful for people who are sharing the show for the first time with their friends with their family they don't want to share a full 60 minute episode they want to share just a clip a little preview what people's appetite for what we talk about in these shows so you can find me on YouTube. Just search Brian J. Matos Podcast. Uh, I also have a link at the bottom of my website, brianjmatos.com, that will take you directly to that YouTube page. Uh, But you can find me, Brian J. Matos Podcast, on YouTube. Search for the videos. You can follow any of my social media feeds and get to them as well. But when you get to those YouTube videos, go ahead and hit subscribe so that every time I post a new clip, you'll be among the first people that see it. And you can preview for yourself and see if this is an episode you want to listen to. Um, But even if you just want to share, uh, sometimes it's easier to share a little five-minute clip with our friends and family than an entire episode. So I encourage you to engage on that platform as well. And then as always, the home base for the program is the website site brianjmatos.com we post show notes every week another great way to preview with your friends and family Uh, we do have the full episodes posted to the website as well we've got some exclusive content on there and we're building out that website every day to be more responsive and more robust and give more content and and help our guests promote by the way Um, their websites their social media accounts their books uh, they're very generous with their time and so i want to do everything i can to uh, promote their activity so that those of you who find them very, very interesting, you can go and learn more about them and do that all from the simplicity of my little old website, brianjmatos.com. As always, I thank you for listening. We've got some great guests coming up. Uh, rather than preview all of them, I'm going to preview next week's episode of the of the program. Uh, it's going to be me. We, you and I haven't talked in a while, just one-to-one. I've had a lot of great interviews. I have some thoughts about the interviews that I have done over the past couple of weeks here and some of the interviews that are scheduled in the weeks ahead. So I almost want to take a little break. Uh, right now we're recording in the middle of summer 2023. I think it's a good time to call a time out here in the middle of the summer months, talk about where we've been, talk about where we're going, um, talk to you about a couple topics that have been important on my mind. And uh, I just think it's a great way for us to continue to build the community. I love my guests. I want all of them to have time on this program, but you and I need a little time together too. And so we'll, we'll do that next week. I hope you'll tune in for that program. And then we have many, many more interviews scheduled in the coming weeks and months. Uh, we want to make this as evergreen as possible. So we try to make these topics salient, whether you listen to them in the summer of 23 or the fall of 23, or you're finding this show for the first time in 2024 or 2025. We hope that this episode and all these episodes will be as relevant to you in the future as they are now. But I do like to give my listeners who are following show by show a little preview of what's coming up next. So it'll be you and me next week, and I look forward to it. In the meantime, thank you all for listening to this episode. Thank you for following me on social media and making this podcast successful. Let's see if we can get this thing to number one in our category. We've got a ways to go, uh, but it starts with you. And thank you all for listening. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for engaging. And uh, the show is all about building a community of curious minds. So as I do every week, I end the program by encouraging you all and uh, wishing you all uh, a fun journey as you all stay curious.